Good evening, everyone. I am Amy Oberholzer from Catch, and on behalf of the entire Catch team, I want to welcome you to tonight's webinar presentation. Uh, once again, we are very happy and proud to be partnering with Compass Health Center, and we are very grateful for the commitment to supporting our community through this extraordinary time. Portions of tonight's event will be recorded, although there is no audio visual being shared on your side. Um, we will make these recordings available to you in the next week or so. If you do have any technical problems tonight, please contact Zoom directly and they can help you out. Uh, throughout the course of the presentation tonight, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A section on your screen. You'll find that um, at the bottom. Um, only the panelists and a couple of us from Catch will see those questions and following the presentation, uh, there'll be a moderated discussion and the Compass team will answer as many of those questions as possible. We can go over time if the discussion is moving along well. We just want to make a quick note, one topic that cannot be fully addressed this evening within the scope of this webinar is the impact of COVID-19 on our kids' education. For students with IEPs and their families in particular, this new normal contains a host of very unique challenges. For families seeking additional support and guidance in this area, CATCH will be including several resources in our summary email including the names of two professionals who can help you navigate these uncharted waters. So it goes without saying that partnering, or excuse me, that parenting through COVID-19 is new and it can be very challenging. Many of us are barely navigating our own torrent of emotions and so supporting our kids can become even more difficult. The abrupt end to normal life, the uncertainty of the future, the disconnection from familiar people are all complicated changes to which children are being asked to adapt, not to mention remote learning. Tonight's panel will guide us on how best to support our kids through COVID-19's significant upheaval. And uh, it is my delight to introduce that panel. Dr. Alex Timchak, attended medical school at Loyola University of Chicago. He completed his residency training at Northwestern in adult psychiatry and his child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at Lurie's. Dr. Tim Cech is the medical director at Compass where he treats kids, adolescents, young adults, and adults with severe mood and anxiety disorders. Also joining us tonight, Roz Lessam. She began her counseling career at Glenbrook North High School as part of her graduate program. She served as a counselor and then student assistant program coordinator at Grays Lake High. Roz is a family therapist at Compass. And as a therapeutic placement consultant, Roz's clinical insight allows her to work with families when a higher level treatment is needed. Margaret Lewis earned her master's degree in clinical social work from the University of Chicago and a Bachelor of Science in Human Development and Psychological Services and Global Health from Northwestern. She completed graduate training at Alternatives, Inc. and Lurie Children's Hospital. Margaret has a broad range of experience as a clinician and case manager and has developed a passion for providing intensive short-term treatment to adolescents and families. And it is my pleasure to hand things over now to Raz Lesson. Thank you so much. I want to start with just doing a really brief overview of what was talked about last night, um, or excuse me, last week in the, in the presentation. And the first part of that is, Margaret, can you advance the slide? Thank you. Um, is face COVID. That was one of the skills. As you will see this evening, we use a lot of acronyms. Um, don't feel like you have to remember them or write them down. This presentation will be available on the Compass Health Center website. Face COVID is a helpful skill for reminding you to recognize your own emotions and to take action from there. The second thing that we also think is really important, Margaret, if you can advance, thank you, is the dialectic. The dialectic is a basic foundation for much of what you will learn this evening, or perhaps already know. Two things can be true at the same time, making space for and validating these two opposing or seemingly contradictory things at once. 
I feel grateful that we are healthy and sad that I can't leave the house. I'm enjoying my family time and I also feel overwhelmed by the responsibility. The key is recognizing the feelings and naming them versus stuffing and avoiding. Now we are gonna move into tonight's presentation. And I wanna just start by saying thank you. Thank you for taking time out of this evening's presentation um, or out of, your, out of your evening to participate in this web, webinar. We want you to walk away with more support and tools that you can use on your own and with your family. Thanks again. Throughout this presentation, we are going to be differentiating between children 12 and under and then 12 and over. Children under 12 are limited in how much they can absorb and process information, how they can analyze and store as well as communicate. They may not be able to fully process words or concepts. Younger children may pick up on the energy and emotions of others who may be experiencing increased anxiety and frustration. Please understand, we are not suggesting that you hide your emotions. It is more about paying attention to what you are feeling and how you express that to your kids. In the environment for younger kids, consider the level of structure, support, and supervision that your children had at each grade and level in school and out of school. With no school activities, seeing friends, restaurants, your actual world has shrunk. And for all of us, the environment, this environment, your house has become all things to everyone, which also can feel incredibly overwhelming for kids and for parents. Certainly the virtual world has expanded. And as I've, as I've heard more than once, it's just not the same and it's not the same. On a relational level, Please keep in mind that your children had a lot more people playing a role in their daily lives pre-COVID. Now there are less people who have taken on the responsibility of all of those other people. You as parents or providers or you as parents or guardians, you're wearing many hats. Teacher, cook, coach, um, activity director, it's a lot and it's very hard to balance. I can't emphasize enough the extra and different responsibilities that you are taking on along with your children. Margaret. Roz. So thinking about our children age 12 and over, keeping in mind in terms of development that oftentimes they are directly consuming the news. They may be getting alerts on their phones, tablets, or laptops, hearing things from friends, and asking more detailed or comprehensive questions about what's going on. We are encouraging each other and all of our families to have conversations around what's happening, and we'll talk a little bit more in the presentation later tonight around how to structure those conversations. One thing that can be helpful to keep in mind is some limits around the conversations and around the news itself. Um, thinking about if it's helpful to maybe set times to engage, to say this is when our family is going to talk about what's going on or we're going to watch or read some news together, and other times where we might choose to disengage or step away for a while. When we think about our adolescents through our emerging young adults, it's also important to keep in mind the environment is a huge shift and that at these ages, seeking to have power and control over the environment is really normal and defining ourselves or our identity and values in the context of our environment. For example, I feel good about myself when I'm in the classroom and I make a peer laugh or get great feedback from a teacher and recognizing that those things are different, working to find ways that we can encourage our teenagers and young adults to still stay connected in safe ways. Also being mindful of those relationships can be really important sources of feedback, um, a way to set goals. I'd like to feel better about this relationship by graduation, or I wanna work on my communication with this teacher. And again, noticing how those things are different and encouraging our teenagers and young adults to find other outlets. Um, and lastly, just keeping in mind for all of us, as well as our children and adolescents, a response to stress that is really normal is sometimes to have behavior or phases that seem abnormal for ourselves. So maybe a child acting a little bit younger than they are or things looking or feeling different for periods of time in, as we mentioned, our new normal. 
thinking about how, as Raz mentioned, we also want to give some strategies for our children and adolescents to be able to support themselves and cope with what's going on. One thing that we have spent a lot of time talking about with each other is this idea of building our children's ability to understand and tolerate their emotions particularly in a time like now where we can't always understand or control what's going on around us. Another way to frame that is an opportunity to spend more time understanding and knowing what's going on inside of us. So a good first step here can be to help our children and adolescents improve their ability to identify and express their emotions. Having open dialogue around how we're feeling using statements like I feel, and increasing what we call an emotion vocabulary or a range of words to describe what's going on inside. That could be done through a chart like you see here or playing emotion charades, or maybe even asking an adolescent who keeps sharing that they're fine or okay, what that looks like or feels like or what it means to them. We have found that there's a great power in being able to name how we're feeling and share that. Sometimes we refer to it in the therapy world of if you can name it, you can tame it. And having that name can help to normalize that that emotion is shared by other people. It's okay to experience. Encouraging our children and adolescents to think of feelings sometimes like a house guest or a visitor. And that analogy can be helpful because a lot of us talk with our students, our children about if someone rings the doorbell, we say hi, maybe not right now, but in other times we would invite them in, greet them, sit with them, and also know in our heads that they'll leave. And that can be the same for emotions, whether it's something that might be more or less familiar, more or less comfortable, can we acknowledge it, greet it, sit with it, and also know that emotion will not last forever. Um, and lastly, recognizing for ourselves and helping our children and adolescents to understand feelings are not facts. For most of us, we may have moments where we feel down or stuck or not very hopeful. And those emotions can be true at the same time that we can have data that things can and will change and get better. I want to start by going over some of the skills. I said at the beginning of the presentation, we really want to share some skills that you can walk away with. And what I'm going to share are grounding skills that literally help you feel more grounded. So the first is four by four breathing. When we are anxious or upset, we very often breathe shallow. Um, we breathe rapidly. Um, and in four by four breathing, we teach that you inhale for four, you hold for four and you exhale for four. As you're inhaling, it can be really helpful, you can't see me now, but to put a hand on your stomach and feel your stomach inflate as you're inhaling, feeling it as you're holding, and then feeling it as it's deflating. Um, and with four by four, a message is literally being sent to your brain to slow down. You're safe versus that fight or flight. As you are counting, you're paying attention to the counting and giving your brain a break from intensive or intrusive thoughts. And this is true for all of the skills that we teach as they are based in mindfulness. And mindfulness at its core is being in the present moment, like literally be where your feet are. The second skill is the five senses, which you can imagine is using your five senses. It can be through mindful eating. It can be listening to a certain type of song. Smelling something in the kitchen that's enjoyable or comforting is another way to be mindful. We often like to use skills and be prepared. We like to be proactive with our families. So one thing that you can do, and this is any age I've done this with, children, adolescents, young adults, is make a coping skills bag. So you don't have to order anything on Amazon. You should have all of it in your house. Um, and you can take something that's tactile, a fidget. You could take a photograph of a favorite place, a favorite vacation place. You could put a mint or some kind of little small wrapped candy. Um, in the bag and then going through, I think you get the general idea, but making the coping bag ahead of time is key because that way you can use it in the moment versus trying to figure out when either you or your kids are in distress. And this is something maybe with younger kids that you're doing is a little bit of a project, which I think kids are really enjoying any kind of projects these days, as well as parents who are doing projects with their kids. ABC mindfulness is pretty self-explanatory. You go through the alphabet. 
um, taking a category. So for example, it could be food, it could be a vacation, vacation places. Um, and you go through apples, bananas, cantaloupe, and you'd be surprised um, how interactive that can be. Kids can do it on their own or they can do it with someone. And sometimes the categories are really, really creative. The last skill I wanna share is tip, one of my favorites. So T stands for temperature change holding an ice cube, um, taking a warm shower, drinking a cup of tea. I stands for intense exercise. Intense means 60 seconds of a wall sit or a plank, which I'm not gonna demonstrate for you right now, but something I always enjoy doing. Um, it can be intense flavor, can be something very sour or something salty. And the P is for progressive muscle relaxation. So it could be a tense and a release starting from your head and moving down your body. It can also be a push, pull, and a dangle that you would do like on the arms of the chair or the seat of the seat cushion of a chair. And again, like all of these skills are just designed to help ground you, to give your brain a little bit of a break. And at this point in this COVID pandemic, what we're experiencing in this COVID world, you deserve a break and so does your brain. Roz, can I jump in for just one second here? Yeah. For, for those of you who have teenagers, especially teenage boys who may roll their eyes and scoff at these coping skills, uh, many of you may have noticed uh, or watched the, the, the documentary about the Bulls, The Last Dance. It's out now uh, on ESPN since there's no basketball, but Phil Jackson actually was widely known for having practices with his players where he would make them all breathe together. Uh, so this is, he used mindfulness um, and only the best NBA coach ever. So um, if they don't believe you, have them look it up. And so this is the real deal that's used in sports. For those of you who actually uh, follow golf, there's many golfers who said that I couldn't win a championship until I knew how to breathe. So this isn't just in the therapy world. Uh, that may give you some street cred with your adolescent teenagers who thinks this who think that these coping skills won't work at all or don't apply to them. Back to you, Roz. <laughs> Actually, back to, I'm going to turn it over to Margaret right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And just adding on to what Dr. Timchuk shared, we will share some resources after this presentation. Um, and some of those will include links to some short videos online or other ways to teach some of those mindfulness skills that sometimes feel um, like Dr. Timchuk was sharing, maybe a little bit more accessible to teenagers or young adults, um, particularly if it's an idea that's new or if we have a child who finds the idea of sitting still or doing something creative like that kind of hard to wrap their heads around. Um, we wanted to be sure to highlight a few other skills that might be helpful when you think about yourselves and your families. The first one here is another acronym. Um, I know we warned you we have a lot in our compass world. And it's called HALT, and it asks us to do literally what it says. So HALT stands for hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And we often use this as a way to keep building that skill of self-awareness or knowing what's going on inside of us or what we need. So this can work for ourselves if we feel like we might notice that we're getting a little bit more irritable or short or feeling off but not knowing why. It also could be helpful if we see our children or adolescents maybe acting off or something seems to not be quite right. Um, and the idea of this would be to pause and say, is there a small step I could take to meet one of these basic needs? The next is bored. Um, so I work every day with adolescents and one thing we've been hearing a lot is I'm really tired, I'm really bored, I've watched everything on Hulu, I've talked to all my friends on House Party, I'm ready for the next thing. Um, so one thing to keep in mind, um, even if this is hard for adolescents to hear, is that being bored is actually helpful. There's some great research that experiencing the emotion of being bored, feeling bored, and sitting in it can actually help us develop our problem-solving skills, make space for some of the mindfulness that like Roz was talking about, um, and help us be creative. The bored skill itself is another acronym, something we can do with our students or they can do, um, the children or adolescents can do on their own. Be creative is the B. O, get outside safely, obviously, now. The R stands for reading or doing something that can be either um, exploratory or kind of taking us out of the moment, ideally a non-screen activity. E stands for exercise, um, so knowing that movement is really strongly connected to mental health, and a goal of 15 or 20 minutes could be 
something that your child or adolescent found on YouTube could be gentle stretching, a quick walk even around the house. And the D stands for do something for others. So thinking outside of ourselves, whether that's something kind for someone at home, maybe calling a relative um, or writing a note for someone in a nursing home or hospital. The next skill is changing the channel, and we can mean this in a few different ways. I think this has felt really relevant with a lot of our teenagers knowing how much screen time is part of their routine, that again, we can have more, more than one channel open of the gratitude and the frustration. Can we recognize maybe we're stuck on that channel of frustration and change it to gratitude? Um, this can be shifting our focus or our mindset. It also might mean changing our activity. So if we're noticing our adolescent is really getting stuck on their math e-learning, can they take a short break and switch to English if we know that's an area that they feel more confident? Lastly, self-care. Um, oftentimes, I think some of our Adolescents and families think of this as going to the spa or something very complicated and extravagant. It can be as simple as acknowledging that we've done something that day to take care of our bodies, taking a short break, um, being more mindful as we're taking some space with a sibling, anything that really is helping us to feel connected to our bodies and making note of what we're doing for ourselves, even if it looks smaller or different in these times. Tolerating uncertainty. So tolerating uncertainty is a part of our daily lives and now is intensified. It can be very helpful to recognize that tolerating uncertainty will build that muscle which will ultimately help you as you recognize what you can and can't control. There are definitely more questions than answers right now, and they can certainly increase stress and worry, as I think all of us have experienced on some level. It's okay to tell your kids that you don't know the answer, and it's also to say okay to say, this is really hard that you don't know, and I don't know either, and I feel some kind of frustrated as well, can be really, really helpful. So it's a lot about knowing what you can and can't control, which actually leads right into the next slide. Thanks, Margaret, um, which is radical acceptance. So as you can see in our circle of control, it's basically what I can control is within the circle. And what I can't control is everything else, which there certainly is a lot of that right now. Accepting re reality as it is, is naming those feelings. Are you angry? Are you sad? You have a right to feel your feelings. Um, and then recognizing that those feelings and those emotions aren't going to change the situation. So what does it look like when you're practicing radical acceptance in daily life? It can be, what do you do to take care of yourself given the, the search? the situation. So right now, you miss your friends, you cannot see them, and you're going to arrange a Zoom get together with them. You know, you can't go to your favorite class, exercise class that you want to, and there's plenty online right now of free exercise opportunities. So it's really what we talk about as the glimmer, the silver lining, making lemons to lem uh, making lemonade out of lemons. So supportive parenting, as I said earlier, parenting is the hardest job out there and definitely is at a whole other level right now. So what I find as a family therapist is that parents are often making suggestions and then feel confused when their kids aren't doing those. So an expect, a suggestion often starts with, I wish you would or you should. I wish you would put down the electronics. I wish you would exercise. But it's not really stating a clear expectation. And again, it's okay to make suggestions, but don't be disappointed or frustrated if your kids aren't following through because you're not really setting an expectation. Um, when you are setting an expectation, it's concrete. We often use SMART goals, which I'm sure many of you know, specific, measurable, achievable, and realistic. Um, consistency is critical around those expectations. And that leads to right now consequences and rewards. And obviously those are gonna look very different right now. But an expectation is your homework or your chore will be done by a certain time 
or Wi-Fi will be turned off for the night or you won't have access to Zoom. Um, and I know it can feel really hard to set an expectation with your child right now. What I will tell you is that kids might not say it, but they need it. They need to know the difference between a suggestion and expectation. They need to know there's also a connection between responsibility, accountability, and privileges. Validating versus fixing. So parents are problem solvers. It's an innate quality and characteristic of being parents. When kids are little and they skin their knee, you knew exactly what to do, right? You clean, you band, you bandaid, and you send them on your way on their way. When kids are older and experiencing something that you might not see, struggling with something, it can be an impossible task to fix it for them. This is something you cannot love out of them. Validation is often what kids and adults are looking for. I hear you. It seems like you might be frustrated right now. It's very helpful, again, to have a proactive conversation with your kids around this. While you love and care about your kids, you cannot read their mind. So being able to say, like, when you're frustrated, what would be helpful for you? You know, do you want me to offer suggestions? Do you want me just to sit with you? So having that proactive conversation can be really helpful. And I think it gives your kids feeling like, leaves your kids feeling like they have a voice, they have a role, um, and they have some control in how they're communicating and the effectiveness of that. The last part of this is consistency and predictability. As I mentioned earlier, kids need both. Be specific in what you're asking for in any situation. Use reflective listening and clarifying so that you know that you're on the same page. I think we're all struggling to differentiate one day from the next these days, these past actually more than a month right now. Um, one way you can do that is Taco Tuesday, Sunday game day. You can give your kids the opportunity to plan a family activity. Um, is it going to be their first choice? Maybe not. And sometimes, again, it's making lemonade out of lemons. Um, Finally, seeds. Um, sleeping well, getting up and going to sleep around the same time is really, really important. I think we all feel like you could sleep a little later and um, you can go to bed a little bit later, but having some structure around that, as Margaret talked about earlier, is also very, very important so that you are getting to the tasks that you need to accomplish on any given day and you're just feeling better. E is for eating right, eating healthy. The, uh, the second E is for exercise in, a, in a, um, a social distancing or appropriate way that's safe right now. And again, there's, man, there's tons of things online right now that you can do. The D is for doctor's orders, following doctor's orders, whether it is around medication for physical or psychiatric needs. If you have a question, if you're unsure, if something has changed because of COVID, please make sure that you're reaching advance, you're reaching out to your doctor. The second thing and the last thing which Margaret talked about, excuse me, the last thing that um, Margaret talked about was self-care. Self-care can be anything from making your favorite dessert, reading a book, a guilty pleasure on Netflix. Seeds is also a great way to model for your kids. And finally, identify the positives. Notice the small accomplishments. It may not be that they are completing the junior research paper or finishing a book report. It can be something small, taking out the garbage or getting an outline done. And identifying the positives, I think, helps your kids pay, know that you're paying attention to what they're doing well. It also can be really helpful for you as a parent or a guardian to remind yourself of what your kids are doing well when there's so many expectations and demands, knowing that every day everyone is doing their best. Margaret? Thanks, Roz. So one theme that we've talked a lot about amongst ourselves and with the families we work with is this idea of how do we plan or look forward when we also are not certain what everything is going to look like or how things may go. Um, and it's really important for us, again, to think within that idea of radical acceptance and in our circle of control 
what we can. So it's important when we think about planning to still have things like Roz was sharing, moments to celebrate milestones, successes, embrace the positives. Also planning for some things to be challenging or to not go well, moments where we're maybe not sure what to do or we know that our children and adolescents are gonna struggle in some ways and we may as well. One thing we talk a lot about is the idea of coping ahead. So using maybe some of the coping skills we talked about, a coping bag, having a set place in the house where your child or adolescent could go to what we call kind of take space or take five to decompress if needed. Um, and also planning ahead for moments where we might want to disengage. These are times where all of us are ending up in some kind of a power struggle or a tug of war with those we're living with. And it can be really meaningful to identify when that happening and choose to drop the rope and walk away. That's not a sign of giving up or not being a good parent or caregiver. It can be a way to kind of preserve our energy and really pick our battles. After a moment that's been tough, it can be helpful to debrief. So talking about how we can each take responsibility. I felt blank when blank happened, what we think went well, what we want to try differently. Oftentimes we talk about rather than trying harder or better, can we try differently? And then validating the emotions. Thinking about particular moments that may be really tough. Can we cope ahead with some things we can do as parents or caregivers to support the child or adolescent? What they they can do on their own and then ways that we can ask for support if we need or have a plan kind of time out or pause. And lastly, um, planning around e-learning. We know that like we've shared being teachers and parents now at home um, and adjusting to knowing that schools are not reopening this school year. There's a lot of stress there. Keeping in mind that this is uncharted territory for all of us. We always frame it as kids do well when they can. The same for parents and teachers. And there will be a lot of gray and uncertainty and some loose ends. And we will all be in the same boat of trying to figure out how to transition back together whenever that may happen. We recommend that for children and adolescents, they stick to a routine and have a set space to do work with some planned breaks. And also looking at e-learning, even if we're struggling sometimes with the content or how to teach or learn, that we have an opportunity there to practice our advocacy skills, to teach our children how to email a teacher and say, I tried this and I'm really struggling. Can you please help me with this? I wasn't able to finish my assignment. Here's my draft. I need help. And building those skills are really things that are transferable and can set our children and adolescents up for success later. And keeping in mind that some of the skills that are alongside e-learning are things that are maybe not academic and maybe hard to see, um, but fall under that umbrella of resiliency. We are building a very resilient generation of children and adolescents who are going to have skills, whether it's independently studying and learning how to do that at a younger age, tolerating not knowing if they got something right because there's a delay with an email or a Zoom. Um, so keeping in mind that there are skills our children and adolescents are learning now as they navigate these challenging times that are going to make them resilient and help them move forward in their lives. All right. Well, thank you both, Margaret and Roz. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so for those of you who were kind enough to uh, attend part one, uh, you may recognize two of these phrases. And I felt it was important for those who haven't uh, heard this to talk about grief and loss for our kids and also as adults. One definition that I, I like uh, is the psychological, behavioral, social, and physical reactions to the perception of loss. Um, and there's a lot of loss, and I don't need to list all of those, but um, how you're dealing with that as an adult and how your children are dealing with it, um, there's gonna be some parallels. Um, one kind of grief that I do wanna talk about is the anticipatory grief, which um, I, I think maybe last week a lot of us were actually dealing with and not knowing it about waiting to hear if the school year was going to be canceled. So knowing that there's a decent chance something bad is going to happen and having it come true. And so for those seniors who know they're not going to have a prom uh, or uh, an awards banquet for their baseball team or even a baseball season, 
Um, whether or not they can talk about that, but knowing that something like that is hanging over their heads, uh, is, I'm sure is hard for them and for you as a parent, wanting to see them be rewarded for all of their hard work. Um, and disenfranchised grief kind of uh, is similar to that. I did talk about this in part one, which is grief that isn't socially recognized. So if your dog suddenly passes away, you're going to be understanding when your kids are upset, but how to deal with the fact that you don't get to see grandma and grandpa over spring break or potentially even over the summer because they have health conditions and they don't want you to come. That's a new kind of grief that we're having to deal with. Can you go ahead and advance it, please, Margaret? Thanks. So in terms of the kinds of loss or the grieving our kids are going through, I referenced this semester seasons, finishing up your second semester as a senior year, or, you know, what if you think that I, I didn't have a real junior year because I had to do e-learning. Are colleges going to think that that's not a real, or my grades aren't real. Does this mean I'm not going to get into my school? I'm sure these are a lot of thoughts that your kids have had. Um, not all kids are upset, as I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that they don't have to deal with some of those stressors. Maybe they didn't love their high school or the uh, having to deal with AP exams. And so maybe this is a relief, but what's going to happen next year when they have to be in person again or when they start college and they don't go through those developmental milestones of graduation? How is that going to impact them? I wish I had strong answers for you, but these are questions that we are dealing with and I'm sure you're thinking about as well. Um, can you move it forward, please, Margaret? For parents, um, I didn't talk about this last time, but I do want to recognize that um, it, this is clearly hard for parents as well. Uh, as a psychiatrist, I, 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 my physical exam is, in, is meeting with someone and seeing how their body language is, how they respond to questions. Having to uh, get used to Zoom has been new, and I'm fortunate I still get to work with parents and kids and other patients, but this is new. What if you are worried about keeping your job? What about you're told that you have to go into the office next week, that you're accepted from the stay-at-home order, but you don't want to because you're afraid you're gonna get sick and you might worry that you're safe, uh, may not be safe. Or what if you're afraid that you might come home and your kids say, dad, are you gonna get us sick? Um, so that's gonna put you outside your comfort zone. You're probably being asked to do stuff maybe you didn't have to do before, and that's expanding your work home boundaries. Um, so you're having to parent and do work and then be a teacher. There's so many layers to this that are really difficult as parents. And so I wanna validate you as parents having to deal with this and not just holding your kids' stress reactions and their difficult times, but you have to give yourself space to think about that as well. So uh, some of the stress to stress reactions that uh, happen in adults happen in kids too. Uh, some common ones that are pretty easy to see if kids are not going to bed till three o'clock, not just because they're FaceTiming or on a house party or Zooming with their friends, but because they can't sleep because they're too worried or they're having nightmares because their stress level is up that's gonna to lead to a difficult following day. Um, sometimes your kids may say, I'm just not hungry because I don't wanna do my work and um, I'm worried about grandpa and not eating until dinner time and losing weight or complaining of frequent headaches or nausea. Those are common symptoms for both depression and anxiety. Uh, increase in irritability. Margaret talked about uh, difficulty with kids pushing back or testing limits. Um, they like to have their way, especially if you have older high school kids. What do you mean I can't go see my friends at the park? It's just down to the end of the block. There's only going to be two people there. Um, or what if kids are saying, I don't need to do my e-learning. I'm just going to watch this next YouTube video. And because they think it doesn't matter. You're recognizing that, I'm sure. And, um, and it's concerning because if it's happening every day, that's going to impact the whole household. If kids are isolating, not coming down for the room at all, taking breakfast, lunch, and dinner up there, saying, um, I'm just going to do all my work in my room and play YouTube and play PS4, um, that's going to be something that's going to be concerning. And I think both for kids and adults, the things that were formerly safe, you can't go to the park right now. We're not worried about that. A, the park is closed. You don't just get to walk to Starbucks, even though it's five blocks away. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about that. And for adults, I can't go to my workout class because I'm just, I'm too worried about that. And even Jewel, to get coffee creamer, it's going to give you, you know, that nagging sensation in the back of your head. Is this the time or am I going to get sick? So these are all these layers that we're contending with and your kids are contending with. 
So um, a very frequent question that uh, we get at Compass and uh, as parents is when do we ask for help? When is it that bad? So uh, I, I think using your gut as a parent, I have four kids and you have to trust your gut, but if you're noticing that something is wrong for multiple days in a row and not getting better, where your kids aren't getting out of their room at all, they're not talking to you, they're not responding, they're not doing things they like to, to normally do, that's a warning sign. If the increased irritability turns into aggression, throwing things, breaking things, leaving the house, um, and you're not getting any information, that's a concern. Um, probably goes without saying, but if you happen to see a text or hear your son or daughter talking about suicide or self-harm, absolutely that's something that you have to take seriously. Even if it's a joke, I would have a conversation with your son or daughter saying, you know, I heard you, over I overheard you say something to your friend when you were playing Fortnite. Can we talk about that? Because I'm worried. Um, you'd have to pick the right situation, but um, I would want to know as a parent, and that's something that you want to absolutely follow up on. If your kids are sneaking alcohol or drugs into the house, I've heard of many adolescent patients have deliveries of marijuana and nicotine products to their front porch, and they don't care about getting caught, that's another sign that would be potentially warranted evaluation. Um, not surprisingly, anxiety about getting sick, not just obsessive compulsive or OCD symptoms, but if kids are too anxious to leave their house because they don't want to get sick or having intrusive thoughts about COVID, that's, that's going to be a concern that's going to warrant a, an evaluation. Margaret, can you push it forward, please? Thanks. So, um, a lot of these are me being Captain Obvious, but uh, I, um, use a lot of different resources to bring these together um, in terms of different age groups to talk about COVID-19. I imagine that we're so deep into this, most of your kids have a decent idea about what's going on, but just start talking. How are you guys doing? What, you know, I know you're frustrated about school. What are your friends saying about COVID? What do you guys worry about? What do you know? Giving an environment where they can be free to and, uh, ask questions and talk about it is really important. And tell the truth. Say, this is a virus that's scary, and I don't know the answers. I'll tell you what I know. But um, you don't want to scare a six-year-old and say, you know, 40,000 people have passed away in the U.S. You want to say, there's a bug that's around that might get me sick. It might get grandma and grandpa sick. So we have to be really careful. And uh, something that I fall into as a parent and as a psychiatrist is that you have to know when you're talking too much. It's okay to stop. It's okay to say, I don't know. Um, kids are really always smarter than we give them credit for. So if you're spinning a tale that's a little bit of BS, they're going to pick up on it. So, and you don't want to have to catch yourself in a lie. And it's better to say, I'm not sure. Let me look at, let me check in on that. Let me research that and get back to you. If you hear that someone that you know is really sick, or if you've had a really bad day, if you're worried about your job, maybe not the best time to talk to your kids about serious questions like, what if I don't want to go to school next year? What if I don't want to go to college? So manage your own anxiety first. So part of SEEDS is self-care. So making sure that you know when it's appropriate, that you can answer questions appropriately uh, and calmly because kids are going to pick up on your anxiety. So using facts not from the book or the gram, Facebook or Instagram, uh, you know, social media is a whole nother conversation. Maybe we'll do another one of these with catch about social media, but it is absolutely a two edged sword. Uh, you may have seen in your community parents posting pictures of teenagers at the park, um, basically publicly shaming the parents for letting their kids be out and not socially distancing. Um, so I would warrant or ask that you be very careful about how much you're uh, looking into social media and you may need to take a break for a couple days. Also for your kids, if your kids are headlong into social media and you know, common media like CNN uh, or Bloomberg or New York Times and they're getting more anxious, tell them it's okay to unplug. I referenced this with younger kids uh, in the previous presentation, but um, when it's time to get them off of Fortnite, when it's time to get them off of the Animal Crossing, uh, try and encourage symbolic play because they may not be able to have the language for what's going on, but for a four, five, six, seven, eight year old, you may be surprised by what narratives come out of playing with dolls, playing with Legos, drawing, painting. And then finally, Roz and, and, and Margaret both mentioned this model for your kids. I'm washing my hands. I'm wearing a mask. I'm best friends with my neighbor and they're having people over, but I'm not comfortable going guys because we're not ready to do that yet until I'm told that it's okay. I'm not going to go. 
this is a quick plug for younger kids from the National Child Traumatic uh, Stress Network that is a, a children's book. It's it, it, where you have multiple different ideas that you can pick and choose from that gives a really nice narrative for your kids. Um, and it does talk through the virus in an age appropriate manner. So that is a, a good resource to take a look at, especially if you want a, some ideas about how to talk with your younger kids. So uh, basic guidelines, I'm gonna burn through these really quickly because Margaret and Roz fortunately covered a lot of them, but schedules are vitally important. Not, I mean, you know they are during a regular school year. This is not normal, but routines mitigate stress. So you may let your kids stay up late to do the 1 a.m. house party on Saturday. On Tuesday, no, that's not okay because it's gonna be turned into, well, why can't I do it Wednesday? Why can't I do it Thursday? You said I could do it on Tuesday. So the answer is no, because I want you to be able to do your e-learning tomorrow. You can do it on Friday or Saturday. Um, and be confident when you say that and just say tomorrow, even though it's a short e-learning day, you need to go to bed on time. So being flexible with weekend schedules is fine. Being patient with your kids. If they have an extra hour on Fortnite because you have to take a work call, it is not the end of the world. But if it's dinner time, you can tell them you don't get to start another game. Um, even for 20 minutes, getting some, your kids to do some exercise. Fortunately, now that the weather's better, um, I think that's vitally important. Give them recess. Say, guys, go run around the block. You can do stuff together. You can bike together as a family, but you need to do something to get out of this house. Uh, I think both Roz and Margaret talked about praising kids is really important. It's really hard to remember, but not to be so black and white. Even little things can help kids feel a lot better. Um, you did such a great job washing your hands for 20 seconds, I counted, to a six-year-old. They might really uh, take that to heart. Um, if, you know, for your, again, your, your junior who's just been able to chip away a paragraph at a really difficult essay, say, I know that was really hard for you. I'm glad you we're able to push through and you can take a break and come back to it um, and be validating that this is really hard for you guys too and we're in this together. So um, some of the hard questions that I've gotten from other parents, patients, and uh, I know I'm not going to be authoritative or exhaustive here. And uh, just to remind you guys, I'm a child psychiatrist, not an epidemiologist or an infectious disease doctor. But these are some uh, of the hard questions that we've gotten and I'll get to answers in the next slide. But I promise I'm only going to be with one friend. I promise we're only going to be six feet apart and there's only going to be two of us in the park. Can we please leave the house and go for a bike ride is one question. I really want to see grandpa. I haven't seen him in two months. I know he's sick, but I swear I won't get close to him. I know I won't get him sick. Um, all of my friends, I covered this twice already, are Zooming at 2.30 on a Tuesday. I have, I have such bad FOMO. I really need to because, you know, my friend is demoing his new track that he wrote. You can still say no to that. And then finally, why can't I go over to Emily's house? All of my other friends are there. Can I please do it? So some of these responses may not be popular. And um, we say very frequently, in fact, Margaret has uh, said this, I think the most encompass, but especially during this time, limits are love. And there are so many uncertainties that um, if fortunately, you may not believe me when I say this, but fortunately we can rely on the experts as saying, I'm not an uh, infectious disease specialist. I am told this is the rule, this is the city ordinance. The answer is no, maybe next week the rules will be relaxed, but no, you can't go to your park because the last time you went to your park, uh, to the park, there were 20 kids there and I'm not comfortable with you going. Similarly with, you know, grandpa, um, I, I'm not comfortable with you going this week and I'm worried that if you go, he might get sick. So the hard part is your kids are gonna get mad. They're gonna blame you. They're gonna say you don't understand. We know we understand. It's the problem that they don't understand. And forgive me for being morbid here for a second, but let's go through the worst case scenario. So let's say they do go to the park and someone gets sick and then your son or daughter gets home and gets sick. What if you do send your son to visit your grandpa and your grandpa gets sick? Your son or daughter, can they deal with that? Can they understand? They'll say, well, I didn't know. So this is for us to decide and it's really hard to bear this responsibility and they're not gonna like it. But as a parent, ask yourself, would I wanna take my kid to the ER right now if I let him hang out last week with his friends and now he's got a 103 fever and is coughing? Do I have to go through that decision in my mind or do I rely upon what the experts are telling me that the risk is still high? So if they're older teenagers, maybe they can hear this, maybe not. Um, and I, I think it is perfectly valid for you to do that and say, 
I don't understand this. I'm doing what I'm told to protect you, to protect grandpa and to protect your friends. And finally guys, we've made it this far and we want this to work. We want the social distancing to work. So now is not the time to lose your resolve. So the last thing, um, I know I referenced uh, Phil Jackson and, and well, the Lakers and the Bulls before, but um, in terms of tough decisions, uh, there's a great article I saw, the links below in the Harvard Business Review talking about leadership. And they referenced Adam Silver, who's the commissioner of the NBA, who way back on March 11th, and I remember this day being like, oh my gosh, the NBA canceled its season. That was forever ago, the, the same day that the WHO declared COVID a pandemic. But because of that decision, March Madness was canceled, NHL, MLB was canceled. And if we think about it now, the amount of exposure that would have happened, that was potentially a historical decision. And so uh, in the NBA lost a ton of money. It's an $8 billion a year industry, but leadership about making unpopular decisions, but to do it for safety, you have to do that right now as a parent. And so uh, I think it's, it's scary to think about, but uh, this is where unpopular decisions can lead to positive outcomes. So on that note, I think we're ready for questions. Um, hopefully I didn't burn up too much time and we still got uh, some time to answer questions. So fire away. <laughs> Great, we've gotten some terrific questions during the course of your presentation. Thank you very much, you guys. That was awesome. You're welcome. Um, I will start with this one and we will move through as many as we can and stay um, as long as it feels right. Um, Dr. Timchek, you named a lot of issues and situations that we might be dealing with or seeing in our kids. Maybe you could call them even symptoms. Um, can you speak or all of you speak a little bit to how we, will, we should actually handle those things when we see them? Who wants to go first? <clears throat> I'm happy to start. Um, I think keeping in mind kind of based on what you're seeing with your child, um, we often encourage ourselves and each other to approach with some curiosity. So taking note of what you're seeing, what's the context. So what happened right before maybe the behavior or the thing your child expressed, what happened after, um, and take some notes, or, you know, mentally or even on paper about kind of what you see going on around it, and then ask some maybe gentle or curious questions to your child or adolescent, um, reflecting back, I noticed this, or I'm seeing this, I'm wondering if that, and try to get a little bit more information, um, you know, keeping in mind if it's something that maybe happens once, or you're seeing as more of a pattern, um, and then once you have more data, that can help inform if it's time to maybe ask for help or go to some of the resources or supports you might already have in place. And I'll, I'll jump in. Thanks, Margaret. Um, and I think having an open-ended conversation, uh, telling your son, hey, Max, you know, I'm, I'm worried about you, bud. You're, doesn't seem like you're talking at dinner. I don't really see you during the day, even though I'm working from home. Um, you, you know, you've gotten really upset over minor things like the Wi-Fi went down and I didn't even turn it off. Is everything okay? Do you want to talk? giving yourself a couple of opportunities to ask. And then if you're sort of the door is getting slammed in your face, then it's, uh, I guess, an approach I would take is saying, Max, you know, I I'm worried about you. Um, and you're not telling me stuff that um, might be going on. And I'm still at home with you and I'm seeing this every day and I'm seeing the irritability getting worse. You know, can you please tell me what's up? And um, if, after two or three times, and again, if some of those warning signs, the irritability, the change in activity level um, are increasing, then you can say, you know, Max, I know you don't want to talk to me or mom, um, but I, I do want you to talk to someone because, you know, this is getting worse and I want to see if someone else can help. Um, so that might be a way to introduce it. And again, you're, you're trying not to be threatening. It's coming from a place of care and concern. Um, you know, you can't force kids necessarily to, to talk on Zoom, although I can tell you it's probably a heck of a lot easier than throwing them in the car and driving to a therapist's office. That is one glimmer of uh, the pandemic is that access to care is a lot easier now. Um, and especially kids who have anxiety, it's maybe a lot easier to just open their laptop and talk on Zoom rather than having to go to a doctor's office or a therapist's office. So that um, I think is, is one way to approach it. Um, and, and again, one thing that I would say that is never easy to talk about, if any of those warning signs or symptoms about scary stuff like suicide, self-harm, um, you know, substance use, 
Um, ask yourself as a parent, do I really want to know this? And so trying to find the right moment away from other siblings and saying, you know, I heard you talking about this stuff. Are you safe? Are you having these thoughts? Um, I know this is a really hard time and I love you and I really want to make sure I'm not missing something. And if you're really struggling, just like if you're having a heart attack, we would need to go get you help and we want to get you help, but um, I, I can't help you if I don't know. Thank you. Uh, we've definitely had a number of questions um, about e-learning mm -hmm. and obviously uh, parents are struggling with how much leeway to give a child, um, how much they should enforce rules. So one of the questions um, reads, our grades in high school can either improve or stay the same. My son doesn't want to complete his work as he's satisfied with the current grade and feels the work doesn't really matter. How do I handle this? And it kind of goes along with another question. Um, a junior in high school who's choosing to watch TV while doing her work and doesn't seem really to be very engaged at all. Should I let her handle that? Should I get involved? Can you guys speak to that a little bit? I can start answering that question. Um, I think one thing around e-learning is again, this is all uncharted territory. So this is not something that teachers have done before. It's certainly not something that kids have done before. I think if your kid, if your son or daughter is, maybe they're watching TV or you see them distracted and they're getting their work done, they're getting their work done. Around the grades are, you know, they're gonna stay the same or improve. Part of it is about developing mastery and how if you don't stay, if you don't keep exercising that muscle in your brain around study habits or study skills and learning subjects, it's only going to make it harder for next year. And so I think that's a way that you can approach it. And I think with kids, it's also with children and adolescents having a proactive conversation. Like, let's talk about this because I don't want to fight with you every day. I don't want to have this battle. You know, sometimes in family sessions, I'm saying, let's do a weekly check-in. Maybe there's a Google Doc and you're checking things off and I can see that once a week but I think proactive and open com open conversation and communication can be really helpful around that anybody else or that that good um, there have also been a, a number of questions about um, seeing increased irritability in our children which mm -hmm. as we all know and what dr. Tim check talked is another symptom um, how much irritability should I accept from my child? And when my child is normally well behaved and now he gets upset at little things like doing the dishes or other chores, um, should I be more flexible and accept these behaviors that normally I wouldn't tolerate as well? Should I enforce punishments? What do you guys? So I think part of that is what Margaret was saying earlier is collecting data and noticing patterns. Um, I think consequences and rewards can be really, really challenging right now. And I think it's important. I think flexibility around picking your battles, right? So if there are you know, certain specific expectations for a day, making sure it's not a list of 10, it's a list of a few so that your child can feel some success. I also think around that irritability, what I often see in families is that when a child is irritable, then the parent becomes irritable and then they're just matching each other and everyone walks away frustrated. So being able to disengage and have one of those validating, like it seems like you're struggling, I'm gonna give you some space why don't you go play a game for a little bit or you know take 10 minutes to use a skill or to, to take some time for yourself and i think that can be a way to start um i also think with the irritability irritability keeping in mind that oftentimes when we're feeling irritable that comes from feeling like we're not being heard we have a need that's not met um, or we're confused or out of control and so again things like that halt skill or other ways to kind of take a look at you know all of us our baseline is probably more irritable than pre-covid so some of that irritability may be normal and knowing your child kind of again looking at the situation and like we've talked about maybe having a conversation outside of that moment where they're angrily washing dishes to say you know help me understand more or think about ways that you could maybe encourage if it's an older child or teenager to say this might be a great time to kind of take a break and you know change the channel or do something different for a bit 
One question that I actually had that I hope will be of interest to others is how important is it to share with your young kids and or your teenagers how you're feeling? Like identifying your feelings and modeling for them. Mm -hmm. um, is, do you think that's an important piece in this whole supporting of our kids thing? So, so I'll tackle that one. So the short answer is yes, I do think it's important. I think you have to couch the language appropriately and not share too much um, and give some points of reference. Like I'm worried about Nana and, you know, she's in Florida and, and if she gets sick, I don't know if we're going to be able to see her or, you know, work's been really hard guys. And so if I was, if I lost my patience before dinner because you didn't get off of Fortnite in time, so I'm ap apologize. And, you know, you know, this is, you know, this is hard for moms and dads too, but that does not mean you can punch your sister because you didn't no scope someone in Fortnite that you wanted to do, or that, um, you know, so, so trying to figure out what the source of irritability is, you know, if they didn't make the state soccer team and they thought they were going to, okay, that's a reason that they might have some really strong emotions, but, um, but if it's something really minor and that their sibling talked too loud um, when they were FaceTiming with their friends, that's not okay. And, and I, I'd say the escalation of, of if it gets to, you know, siblings hurting each other or hitting you or taking the car, I think that goes without saying that, you know, there's certainly off limits behavior. Uh, but, but that's a two part answer to a one part question. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, so no, I would no, say it is fine. Um, and I would encourage you, to, I mean, that, that does foster an air of open communication uh, in, in a household that you guys deserve to know, you know, what we're thinking. And so, and, and we are worried and we don't have the answers. Um, but I, I do think it's important to try and know where you'd like to stop because if you tell them too much, it might actually backfire and they would worry more. Right. That's the. I'll Oh, sorry. I also think modeling that I'm having this emotion and I'm choosing to act in a certain way. So kind of building off of that, like I was feeling really frustrated earlier and I'm going to choose to take a break now, or today was a day I felt really sad and I'm grateful I was able to get through what I needed to do. Um, I think we can also model that emotion and pair it with the resiliency or help model for our kids that we can have really intense emotions. We can feel a lot of distress and we're still in control of our behaviors and can still um, take some perspective around them. I think this is um, an interesting question. My third grade daughter craves interaction but gets overwhelmed and upset about her non-academic class Zoom meetings even with half the kids present. Do I help her work through this reaction or just let her avoid the meetings? I'll take that one. I would definitely say support her during that versus avoiding because if you're avoiding what you're saying is you can't do this. If you're helping support her, you're saying, I recognize that you're struggling and let's figure out together what's hard for you. You know, and if, if, if someone can ask prompting questions or probing questions, if a parent can ask that, then the child's able to identify, I get nervous when I talk, or um, I'm afraid of how I look on the camera, or what if I don't do well? Um, and I think those questions can be answered, and part of it is the human condition, right? Nobody needs to be perfect. That's not what we're looking for, but I definitely think not avoiding is teaching your, your kids that they can't do something. I also think a good chance to practice that advocacy. Um, we've heard from a lot of students and parents that it can be tough for a variety of reasons um, for things on Zoom. So it might be a good opportunity as a parent, if you're comfortable to reach out to a teacher um, or whoever's running the Zoom call to say, hey, my daughter is struggling with this. Do you have some suggestions? Or just to give you a heads up, we're gonna try this and we may need some more support. Uh, just to continue, we have a number of really good questions here. What if your child is having sleep issues that resurfaced during this quarantine? Should I stick to the rules or take a more nurturing and flexible approach considering everything that's going on? So, so that's a very popular and common question. Um, and so I think if it's family movie night and your six-year-old is staying up to watch the end of Frozen 2, okay, that's not the end of the world. But if your son or daughter is coming into your room every night at one o'clock saying, I can't sleep because I'm worried too much, obviously those are different. 
Um, one of the things that, um, fortunately now the technology is more affordable that I sometimes recommend if kids are struggling with sleep is to actually have them use a smartwatch or a Fitbit and to track it um, because it's kind of fun. They get to see the data like, oh wow, I got eight whole hours. Uh, and so I think trying to balance between if it's a school night, then you know try and keep them within an hour of a set bedtime because even though the kids may not say it, in fact, they'll actually actively deny it, but having it clear expectations um, and, the, you know, again, with some wiggle room is important. So um, if they're going to bed at 10, but waking up at nine and still getting all their work done for, a, let's say, an eighth grader, not the end of the world. But um, if they're persistently having, taking three, four hours to fall asleep or waking up and, um, you know, you being both nurturing and rigid in terms of the, uh, the, the time frame isn't working, that would be a situation to reach out to your pediatrician. Um, I'm not going to give specific medication advice, but there are some non-prescription medications that can be used that are very safe. That would be first-line interventions if all of the behavioral uh, techniques don't work. And most pediatricians would be comfortable doing that uh, over the phone. Um, and so, but I would absolutely recommend behavioral interventions first and sleep tracking. So you may have to sacrifice your smartwatch for a few weeks to give it to your kids, but uh, it's kind of cool when they say, wow, you know, I thought I didn't sleep last night, but geez, it says I got eight hours. Uh, it could be really useful. So it sounds like a lot of um, what you guys are suggesting across a lot of uh, different areas is really monitoring and watching and kind of collecting data and information about your kid to see if it becomes a pattern. Is that okay? Um, let's see. So our kids are going to be out of school for a long time and away from kids of similar ages. Um, what do you guys think? Will this have a negative impact on kids? And is there a solution that we could work toward to, you know, other than Zoom, I guess, um, there seems to be concern about being apart from their peers. So I'm happy to, to just quickly jump in. I think there are goals Going to be negative impacts of COVID. Um, and there will, again, come back to the idea of, of positive impacts and resiliencies. Um, you know, I think being creative kind of based on your kid and their interests, there are, you know, there are some ways safely, I believe, to still send things like via snail mail. I know it makes me sound old school. Um, there might be ways, I know some children have done the like post a letter from your school in your window and kids can walk around the neighborhood and see. So there, there may some, be some ways that we can be creative, um, keeping in mind our health and safety first, obviously, of still trying to help um, children stay in touch. And I would add, I, I'm sure you, this will not be the first time you've heard about the drive-by birthday party, but uh, you, everyone can pile into the car or the van and go see their friends and, you know, from their porch or their stoop and saying, we miss you guys. How are you? Happy birthday. Uh, so there is going to be some visualization that's going to happen. Obviously not going to be to the level of hanging out, um, but uh, in, in call call me an endless optimist, but I do think that there are going to be many things about uh, social isolation that we are going to miss. The simplification, the fact that people have maybe are reconnecting with family values, uh, that they're not racing around all the time, and, uh, and the fact that, as Margaret said, that, that kids are already resilient, but that they, they did this together, and, and there's certainly going to be things they look back on that they're not going to like, but the fact that it is shared by everybody is really uh, obviously so novel compared to an earthquake or a flood or a hurricane that there's going to be a common narrative that I actually think whether it is going to be six months or six years, that there is going to be similar to, let's say, 9-11. People always have a story about where were you, well, when you're our age, um, you know, during 9-11. Um, and not that you would want to talk about that a lot, but uh, that I do think with COVID, what did you learn? You know, which teacher did you like the least because of the homework they gave? Um, what was the thing that you were most upset about? That it is going to be actually a conversation starter. So I do think it's reasonable that there will be some glimmers there. Um, and that I would be amazed that for 90% of maybe even more than that, 95% of the kids, when they can get back to normal, it's going to be like they didn't miss a beat. That makes sense. Um, there is, there's one question. Um, I am home. I'm a parent at home with um, adult children in their early 20s. Do 
the support skills stay the same for young adults that age or are there other things um, that I should think about? I could take that one. I think that for young adults, I mean, many of the skills that we shared even tonight are skills that, are, that we use um, for children, adolescents, young adults, and adults. Maybe they need to be shared differently. Maybe there is some wiggle room for what you're doing, especially around expectations um, and what you're asking for. Um, but I think there are definitely other skills. We wear, we'll share some links and some information, but I think for young adults, it is for many young adults who are living back home again, right, after being independent. And I always go back to those proactive conversations and how important that is to say, to name it. You know, you haven't been home. Like, let's talk about how this is going to work. You know, are you going to, what is your responsibility for a night? And I think that in some cases, young adults want their voice to be heard. They don't want to feel like they're 15 again and they have to do everything that their parent or guardian tells them. So maybe a young adult has a cooking night. Um, but some of the skills, I think the grounding skills, the coping skills, um, understanding radical acceptance and tolerating uncertainty are all things that are applicable to young adults. Okay, maybe we'll just do one or two more if you guys don't mind. Sure. Um, this question says, I struggle because kids are doing all e-learning and getting great grades and teacher kudos, but they want to spend the rest of the day on video games. They are happy and well adjusted if I let them play, but I feel guilty that it's wrong to play so many video games, so I tell them to get off, and that's when the problems and all the frustrations start. Can I just let them play, or do I create anxiety by forcing them off? <laughs> a lot of us are familiar with that one, mm -hmm. I'm sure. So, so I guess I can jump in. Sure, you create anxiety because uh, they're doing a preferred activity, right? I did my job. I checked the box. Why can't I spend the rest of the day doing what I want to do? Um, you know, depending on the age of your kids, you could say, well, I didn't want to spend the rest of my day working, but I did and I'm working, but I want to have dinner with you and hear about your day, even though I know most of what happened. Um, and so I think trying to set up the conversations and so that you give them an opportunity. Um, I know I keep referencing Fortnite because my kids play it, um, as I'm sure you figured out, but uh, as you probably know about the game, as opposed to games maybe when we were younger, that they want to finish the game. You can't just stop it right there because they want to get the points and the experience and, and get the, the dub uh, by finishing the game. And so if you say dinner's at 6.30, then you go to the basement or the room and say maybe at 6.05, being, hey, guys, dinner's at 6.30. Do not start a new game after 6.10 because I expect you at the table. And if they're there at 6.31, do you freak out? But um, having some benchmarks, even if, you know, especially if they're, they're getting more irritable to say, and, and you know, I'm, I'm noticing that you guys are playing what I think is way too many video games. So tomorrow from two to four, we're gonna be off video games. I'm, you're gonna go outside and I want you to read a book. Of course, they're gonna protest. But if you, if you really want a sobering thing, Ask to see what their screen time is on their iPad or their phone. Uh, that's not going to give you uh, a warm and fuzzy feeling. It's going to be probably way too many hours that you want. But also, you could use that as a benchmark. You'd be like, really? Well, let's say it's six hours. You were on your phone for six hours today. Did you learn anything? Probably not. I was FaceTiming with my friends. It's still plenty of screen time. Go outside. So trying to get, again, this, as you said, it's a pattern, getting more data and saying, guys, we need to change this up because this isn't good for you either. I mean, I don't want to be on screens for eight hours a day. I take a break. I walk the dog. Um, and so we're going to try something differently. Um, and I think they'll realize that too. And you may hear them say, well, to you know, Tommy's mom lets him play as long as he wants. No, she doesn't. Uh, and so I think maybe don't do it that day, but say tomorrow we're going to do things differently. And I, that's Margaret's catchphrase, but so give them a fair warning and then follow through. 
I think also we talk about the skills as, as things that you have to practice, right? Like practicing that muscle or building that skill of things and keeping in mind that when this is over, it's going to be a really hard shift if it's been a full day of preferred activities to a day of bells ringing and quizzes and tests and things like that. So another way to maybe frame it is kind of keeping ourselves in shape or keeping our muscles toned for having some of those expectations or non-preferred activities like Dr. Tim Chuck was talking about. That makes sense. I think we should be mindful of everyone's time and um, probably call it an evening now. I want to thank our panelists so much. It was a really, really good evening. Um, and thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, be safe, be healthy, and give yourself some grace. Thank you. Thanks everyone. So uh, this again should be available on the compasshealthcenter.net website um, under the community tab, the furthest right hand corner um, soon. I can't tell you when, but uh, thanks again for having us and we appreciate you participating and thanks for asking great questions. Hopefully this was helpful. All right, Margaret, I think you need to stop sharing the screen. So I'm going to end the broadcast. There we go. Okay. All right. Have a good night, everyone.